read this morning, Luke chapter 23. This is sermon number 122 in our series in the book of Luke. Uh, we've been preaching through the book of Luke since fall of 2019. We will get through it eventually, I promise. Some of y'all are like, can we just be done with Luke? Uh, but there's just so much there. And one thing I promised myself at the beginning was, there's no need to get in a rush. Let's get everything we can get out of it. And I, I genuinely thought we were going to get into the resurrection of Jesus Christ this week. Because uh, where we are in the book of Luke is... Uh, in Luke 23, was Jesus has died on the cross. He's already uh, suffered and died for our sins. A man named Joseph of Arimathea went in boldly, as we saw last week, and he, and he begged for the body of Jesus. He got Jesus' body down uh, before 6 p.m. on a Wednesday night, and he got him buried, but it was, it was i am be honest, it was kind of a rush job. Jesus was never embalmed, almost like God knew that he was going to come back. He didn't need to be embalmed. And so it was kind of a rush job to his burial, and so last week we covered that, but then I, I kind of breezed past verses 53 through 50, or 54 through 56, and I thought, you know what, there's something here, and God showed me something that I didn't want to pass by, and so let's stand together, if you would, and I'm going to read Luke chapter 23, but I'm just going to warn you up front, we're not going to get to uh, chapter, or we're not going to get to the resurrection of Jesus Christ quite yet. And so Luke chapter 23, and if you can, if you're able, please stand in honor of God's word, and we will read verse 50. 55, or actually, let's go to verse 54. Actually, just for context, <laughs> let's go all the way back up to verse 50, just so everybody sees the context. Verse number 50, the Bible says this in Luke chapter number 23, And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just, meaning a just man. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went in unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that would be like a cave, stone, grave, that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. Verse 54, this kind of starts our text. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the woman also, the women also, which came with him from Galilee, these women are also mentioned in verse number 49, and, and in other Gospels we, we're told who they are, uh, but we're not going to get into their names because Luke doesn't, followed after. So they followed after Joseph and beheld the sepulcher and how this body was laid. So they got a visual, this is where he is. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now upon the first day of the week... That's Sunday, even, even in our calendars, the first day is Sunday, it's still Sunday for them. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, thank you for how relevant and powerful it is today. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would help uh, help us to see how relevant it can be even in 2023. Thank you for the guests and the friends and the visitors that came for our friend day, that came from the area. Uh, Lord, I ask that you give them a special blessing for being here. Uh, Lord, but now that it's preaching time, help us all to focus in on your word. Uh, you have something for every person in this room, I have no doubt. You knew exactly who would be here as, as you had me prepare this message. And you know the needs of the people in these rooms. So I ask that you to facilitate and help those needs through your word. Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, there's never been a time they've called on Jesus Christ to be their Savior, Lord. They don't have a time and a place. I ask that today they would, they would make that decision for you. Lord, be with me as I preach. Lord, calm my nerves. Empty me of self and with the Holy Spirit. Thank you for allowing me to serve. Thank you for allowing me to even serve with my family. And Lord, I ask that you'd bless this time and use it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I titled the message this morning, From Thursday to Sunday. From Thursday to Sunday. I hate the in-between. Now that's kind of vague, I know, but let me explain. There are different times in life when you are in between two exciting things. And in between those two exciting things is the in-between and the in-between is miserable. I'll give some examples because that's still kind of vague. Uh, I, can, I can still vividly remember every time my wife has told me she's pregnant. Four times now, I can still vividly remember all of them. That's exciting. 
uh, we, we tried for, for Izzy, our oldest. We'd actually been trying for like a year. And so, it, you know, sometimes it just doesn't happen in your times. It's God's time. And so when it finally happened, it was like a yippee. We're going to actually have kids. We'd already been married over four years at that point. And so we were excited. And then I still vividly remember the day Izzy was born and holding her for the first time and, and the excitement of it. Those two periods were so exciting. But the time in between... <laughs> Now, I'm not going to complain too much because I'm not the one carrying a child, amen? <laughs> but the time in between is not as fun. Okay, with the first one, there's a little bit of excitement, I'll be honest, because you're buying all these new things and you're getting all these new things because you don't have any of that and you're setting up a nursery that your wife doesn't ever use anyway. She just, <laughs> why didn't we start with the crib in our room? I don't know. But anyways, uh, in between is not as fun. But there's the excitement on both ends. But the in between, eh. Another great example of this is dieting. Eating whatever you want and however much you want is so exciting. In fact, it does release dopamine. It is a great feeling. I love sitting down with a, a mug full of chocolate ice cream that I mix in many M&Ms with, and I drink it with Dr. Pepper. Yeah, because one layer of bad for you is not good enough. You know, I got to layer the bad. Oh, I love it. But at the same time, at 30 years old, I like being in shape. I like to exercise. I like to work out. I like to uh, I, I coach sports, and I love to get out there and play with the kids and run around the kids. I love feeling good. So if I decide I want to stop doing this, eating the ice cream with M&Ms and Dr. Pepper at like 10 o'clock at night too, like right before bed, you know, so it's like the worst time for you because you're not burning those calories. You're just going to go ahead and turn that right into fat. If I stop doing this, but I'm not yet here, you know, the physique you want, the feeling you want, that time in between stinks. You ever started a diet, like first day, you're like, no, I'm on a diet, I'm on a diet, so I'm going to be good. So you wake up, and for me, when I diet, I just drink a protein shake in the morning in hopes that that gets me. Sometimes I'll fast, it depends on the day, but I'll, I'll drink a protein shake, and then lunch, I'll have two pieces of fish. No sauce, very little seasoning, two pieces of fish. Then I get home, and, and my wife will make whatever she makes for dinner, let's say, uh, Let's say it's, oh, I've, I've talked about shrimp pasta bake before, I think. But one of my favorite dishes of hers is shrimp pasta bake. I love shrimp. I love seafood. But then she, she makes this homemade sauce. I'm talking from scratch, ladies. You know what I'm talking about. With all these weird seasonings, she's like, hey, I need dill weed for this. I'm like, what? <laughs> there I am in the grocery store, like, dill weed, dill weed. <laughs> is, that, is that a real thing? Are you, are you pulling my leg? Does this exist? She's like, yeah, I need clam juice, too. And I'm like, clam juice? What is clam juice? <laughs> but it exists. And she makes this homemade sauce. And then, you know, if you're going to have pasta, you got to have bread. You know what I mean? So garlic knots or bread sticks or you get that French loaf and you cut it thick boy too. I don't want the little thin slice. I want the thick slice and you lather that thing in butter and you, oh, you get some little garlic salt on there or something. Ooh, ooh. And I get home and she's got all that and I'm like, oh, I'm dieting. So I, I don't need any of the bread. I have a small serving of the pasta and I just eat mostly shrimp. Frank. And then it's my time of the day to finally relax. Problem with relaxing is I like to eat when I relax. Yeah. It kind of goes hand in hand. If I sit down on the couch, I'm sitting down with, uh, you can ask my wife, I've got peanut butter M&Ms. I, I, I guess I have an M&M problem because I've got the minis, got the <laughs> peanut butter. Got to have the ones with nuts because you can justify the ones with nuts. You're like, it's protein. It's protein. <laughs> And so I like to snack, get my ice cream, but I, I refuse. And so that whole day has basically been a day of misery and eating. And I get on the scale, or I look at myself in the mirror and I go, There's no change! None! What? <laughs> Getting from there to there, the in-between is the worst. Another example, and uh, somewhat recently when we bought our van, I guess it's been a few years now, but... I like buying a new car, or not like brand new, I don't buy brand new, but like just the, just the fun of like, hey, we need to, uh, we already had had two kids, and we knew we still wanted more kids, and so we had, a, we had my truck, and we had a Dodge Charger, well, if you know the Dodge Charger, they got a big back seat, but they're not wide enough for three car seats, and so we thought, well, if we want to have another kid, we got to get another car, and that's kind of fun to me, I love researching, I love vehicles, I like talking about them, uh, you can ask Tristan, we've had complete truck rides of hours where it's just talking about trucks. It's, it's, it's how we do. And so uh, yeah, I love it. And so I start digging into, okay, if we're going to get a minivan, I want the best of the best, what year models to avoid. And it's like the shopping part is fun. And then when you're driving that new vehicle off the lot, like it's yours, that's fun. 
Any of you ever gone through the paperwork section? The credit check, the down payment, the, all the agreement. It's like, this stinks. And your kids, my, I remember my two kids, the poor kids were just having a time. And then it was like, hey, they said, hey, you know, the van hasn't been detailed yet. And that takes hours. And I'm like, do it. I'm not, I might as well because it's kind of in the price anyway. So we went and we got dinner. And it was like the kids wouldn't eat what we got. It was Popeye's chicken. I was like, what's wrong with you? Y'all need to get saved. And, <laughs> and so we were eating Popeye's chicken and they didn't want anything. And they were miserable. And they were in the, you know, you're in, the, you're in there trying to do paperwork. And they want to run free. And it's like, you can't. And I'm like, Holly and I are trying to discuss things. And, ah, ah, ah. I think back to that day and I'm like, oh, I hated that day. I loved the shopping. I love the driving away. Actually, I didn't drive it away. I drove my truck because it's my truck. And I let her drive the minivan. But I told her she looked real hot in it. So uh, she drove the minivan. But that time in between, (sighs) miserable. Many of you know where we're going in the book of Luke. We are going probably next week, unless God again changes it or shows me something. We're about to be in probably one of the greatest passages, if not the greatest passage in the Bible, it should be the greatest, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every year at Easter, we celebrate that very thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's the most exciting thing that happens in the Bible, that Jesus died and he was dead for three days and three nights and then he rose. But do you understand that in our text, we went from a period of excitement, Jesus' triumphal entry, we'll get into that in a minute, To the excitement of him raising from the dead, but the in-between, not so exciting. Let me explain. Let me kind of go through a little bit of history, and I'll do this kind of quickly. Uh, John's an even better example, but the book of Luke, from verses 19 through chapter 23, or from chapter 19 to chapter 23, those four chapters are all about the last like four days of Jesus' life. Three, four days. Four chapters over 96 hours. And a lot happens. A lot happens in those chapters. Let me try to explain really quick. Uh, In chapter number 19, it's Palm Sunday. The reason we call it Palm Sunday is because Jesus rides in to Jerusalem on on a colt, on a donkey that had never been ridden. And people are throwing palm leaves before him. And people are throwing their clothes before him. And so he's not even trotting on dirt. And everybody's crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Meaning, like basically acknowledging the Messiah has come. Jesus is here. And everybody's excited. And then he goes in and he cleanses the temple. And he gets all the, the, the people that are in there for, for money out and he's like this is not a house of, uh, of money this is a house of prayer and we're going to get this right and then he's teaching in the temple for, for a couple days and man he, he has these face offs and man I had so much fun preaching him of Jesus basically facing off with groups of religious guys that are literally their only mindset is I'm going to stump this man and they go up and they think they got him and every time Jesus spun it back on him and it was like made them look stupid and I'm like yeah by the way it's okay to read your Bible sometimes you go yeah I do it all the time if you're a you ever read Elijah on Mount Carmel? That's one of them like, yeah, kind of passages. Anyways, and so it's just exciting, and it's fun. And, and, and then he's in the temple, and then that Tuesday night is something so, uh, something so intimate and, and special. It's, the, it's really the start of the Lord's Supper. It's known as the Last Supper, but it's the initiation of one of our, 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 our ordinances, the, the Lord's Supper. And Jesus sits down with his disciples, and he sups with them. And, and man, even during that di- dinner, there were so many special things that happened. Jesus getting down, girding himself, and washing the feet of the disciples, showing what true leadership is. It's serving him. And, and just, it's an amazing picture. And he goes through all that, and he tells them about Judas going to betray them. And even though none of them catch him, they all think it's him. And he calls out Peter on his life, because Peter's like, I'll go to prison or even death with you, Jesus. And he's like, no, you won't. <laughs> No, you won't. And he says, no, really, I will. He says, before the cock crow, you're going to deny me three times. We saw that. And, and, and just continued on through the, through the passage and through the Bible uh, of good things that were happening. And then uh, it gets kind of dark. It goes from excitement to dark because then Jesus, as he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and great drops of blood are pouring down from Jesus' face as he's praying. And, and he's so stressed and he's so not worried and, and, and stressed in a negative way, but he's so thoughtful on what is about to take place on the cross in, in and that was in Luke chapter, uh, I believe it was number, uh, chapter number 20 maybe. And then of course here comes Judas with the, with the religious group and they come to take Jesus. And then they take Jesus and he goes through all these mock trials. All these sham trials where, where they couldn't get the witnesses to agree and they've got nothing against him. And Pilate says, I find no fault in this man. I find no fault in this man. And so 
he says, we should let him, let's, just, I'll, I'll even, hey, I'll appease you guys. I will beat him. Then I'll let him go. And they said, no, crucify him, crucify him. By the way, same group that said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna on Sunday. Wednesday, they're going, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And, he, and so Pilate, again, he, he gets a, a man named Barabbas, a known murderer and a thief. And he says, I'll release to you one of these men, Barabbas or Jesus. And they're like, give us Barabbas. And he's like, fine, I'm washing my hands of this. And they said, let his blood be upon our hands. In the hands of our children. By the way, how rude is that to say, hey, let our kids pay for this too. And so, uh, so Jesus goes through the sham trial and they end up, and, and I don't want to go into all the details again, but man, do they beat Jesus. People punch him and spit on him and rip his beard out of his face. And he gets whipped 39 times by a cat of nine tails. And he's forced to carry his own cross up Golgotha's hill, which, which the Bible tells his vestige was so changed. If you didn't know it was Jesus, he was beaten so bad you wouldn't be able to tell. And he, carries, he tries to carry his cross up, and he can't even make it all the way because how badly they beat him. So a man named Simon of Cyrene, in chapter 23, verse 26, carries the cross the rest of the way for him. And then they nail Jesus to that cross, and then they pick up that cross, and they drop that cross in. And as it thumps, as it thumps at the bottom of that hole, man, does it dislocate joints, and it dislocates bones out of socket, and Jesus struggles to breathe. But then on that cross, Jesus made seven incredible statements. This isn't all of them, but it included ones uh, like this. Oh, I already Turn the page. Here it is. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He told the thief on the cross next to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. He, he took the time to make sure that his mom was taken care of by John. Then he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then his last thing that he said was, It is finished. And right there on the cross, he paid for the sins of all mankind. And then he was buried. Last week we saw his burial in chapter 23, verse 53. Which, I know many of you haven't been here for the whole timeline. There's a common misconception, and I understand where it comes from, but I just want to clear something up. Jesus didn't die and was buried on a Friday. I'll explain that in a minute, but just trust me. He died on a Wednesday, was buried on a Wednesday night. Because he had to be in the grave three days and three nights. That's what the Bible says, three days and three nights. And you can't get three days and three nights from Friday night to Sunday morning. It's, it's, it's not there. You say, well, he, it, it says right there. It says right there that it was uh, the day of the preparation for the Passover. That must mean that it was, it, was, uh, about, it was Friday about to be Saturday. Well, let me try to give you this without getting too much into it. This was the feast of the Passover. So very simply, the feast of the Passover... Had it took days, and so it was actually starting on Thursday, our Thursday. And because it was the first day of the feast of the Passover, it was known as a high Sabbath day, which meant it was like a Sabbath day, it was special because it was the feast of the Passover. So they had a Sabbath day on Thursday, then Friday was a regular day, while well, they were still celebrating the Passover, and then Saturday was their normal Sabbath day, and then it's Sunday. So that's why it was, that's why if you get the timeline, and that's why I understand how people make that mistake, but I just want to clarify for you. And so, uh, everything that we just talked about, and I just crammed a lot of it very fast, that happened in like 90, 96 hours. And I didn't, I just gave the, the high points. I did not, I've been preaching through those 96 hours for like the last six, seven months, I think. Maybe longer. I have to go back and look. And then he's in the grave for about 85, roughly. And not much happens in those 85 hours. 96 hours, four full chapters. 85 hours, four verses. And here's what it says. Let's kind of go through it. That's what our text is about, is what happened in the intermediate. And so uh, back to our text, uh, verse number 54. And that day was the preparation... And the Sabbath drew on. So that was Wednesday, the day they prepared for the Sabbath. And then it says, basically Thursday came. The Sabbath drew on. And the women which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher. So they saw the sepulcher that Jesus was laid in and how his body was laid. They knew, he, and, and I need you to understand this as well, it was a rush job. Jesus died a, around 3 and a little after 3 o'clock 
on Wednesday, 3 p.m. our time, Jesus died. And because Sabbath started at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, because that's how their calendar worked, he had to be in the grave in three hours. And that takes time. And so they kind of rushed through the burial process. So these women saw where he was laid, knew that the Sabbath was just moments away, and knew they couldn't embalm him and finish all the job. And so they took note of where he was. I see where Jesus laid. And we will come back after the Sabbaths. So then, uh, so we saw what happens Thursday, Friday, uh, and then it says, and they, verse 56, and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. And so actually between verse 55 and 56, it goes from Thursday to Friday when they would have prepared, and then to Saturday, which was also a Sabbath. Everybody kind of with me? There's not much there, but just bear with me. Then chapter 24. They show up to the grave early on Sunday with the intention of finishing two things. One, they knew he wasn't embalmed yet. And that's something that needed to be done. By the way, I think it's so... I, I just noticed this this week. How cool is it that Jesus was never embalmed because it was almost like he was saying, I don't need to be embalmed, I'm coming back. I, I, don't, I don't need you to do all the stuff you normally do to somebody that's dead that's going to stay dead for a long time because I'm going to come back to life like in three days. So chill out. And so they knew he wasn't embalmed. But another thing that was required by the law, and I, don't, I couldn't figure out what the, why this is, and I'm not some Jewish or Israelite historian or understand. I know what the Bible tells, and when I try to understand more of it, it's just complicated. But um, the, the law required that three days after you were buried, you had to be anointed. Don't know why. I figured it out, but that was what the law. And so they get there early on Sunday morning with the intention of embalming him. That's where we stopped our text. That's where we stopped the reading today. So just, I know I covered a lot in like 10 minutes, so let's recap real quick. The last 96 hours of Jesus' life, four chapters of the book of Luke, just chock full of things, excitement, Jesus, triumphal entry, things are happening. And then next week we're going to cover, Lord willing, Jesus raising from the dead. But then there's this in between. This 85 hours. Excitement on this side. A lot of excitement on this side, the in-between. Let me ta tell you real quick what didn't happen during that 85 hours. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the disciples came and were, got out there and got to the temple and started preaching, hey, don't worry, he's dead, but as he said, he's going to raise from the dead in three days, amen? The disciples didn't do that. By the way, shame on them because Jesus told them Tuesday night, Tuesday night, the last time he had them all together, he says, don't worry, I'm going to die, I'm going to come back. Not in those words, I'm paraphrasing because I'm an idiot, but Jesus said that. And yet, nowhere do we see them getting out there and going, everybody calm down, we, just, we did just kill the Messiah, but he's going to come back from the dead. We don't see that. No, something else we don't see is God didn't send, like, raise one of the old prophets from the dead. Like, could you imagine if he, like, raised up Isaiah to go and preach and proclaim? By the way, don't forget, this is Jerusalem during the Passover. A city that's usually got about 100, 100 to 115,000 people has, a, has possibly approximately a million people crammed in it. A prophet could do some damage in that. And so, it's not like a prophet, it's not like Isaiah came back from the dead and said, no, did none of y'all read Isaiah 53? I told y'all what's going to happen. He's going to die. He's fulfilled all the other things. Like a lamb, he was quiet. He didn't fight back. He didn't go to them and argue his case. Like a lamb, silently to the slaughter, he was killed. But don't you worry. He's going to raise from the dead. We do all these things. This is what Passover is all about. That's what Passover is about. They're celebrating the Messiah. The covering of blood that atones your sins. And they're celebrating that. And it's not like it says Isaiah comes and says, Guys, hello. He'll be right back. That didn't happen. No one was proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, people continued to celebrate the Passover as if the Messiah had not come, even though they just killed him. Now this is where our introduction comes in. Remember the introduction? I hate the in-between. Exciting on this side, right? I love eating ice cream with mini M&Ms specifically. If you're going to be big, I've got to crush them up. Mini M&Ms, Dutch chocolate, bluebell ice cream, mini M&Ms, and Dr. Pepper. I love that, but I like a six-pack, like the abs. Get from here to there is miserable. I love when my wife tells me, 
I'm pregnant. We're expecting. Exciting. The time in between. Oh, my wife's in a nesting phase right now. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically where your pregnant brain says, I've got to prepare everything for this baby. And so my house is getting turned upside down. She's, she's going through every closet. She's going through everything. And here's the problem. All those projects all of a sudden become my projects. She, she, she calls me in. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I was like last Monday. She calls me into Izzy's room. She goes, is there anything we can do about this closet? Because Izzy's closet is kind of narrow, but it's deep. And so she literally made me rebuild like an entire closet in there. <laughs> like I got a job and sports to coach and people to visit and visits to make. Sure, babe. I, hate, I love when she says I'm pregnant, and man, do I love that first time holding any of my children is just special as I'll get out. I hate the in-between. There was the excitement of chapters 19 through 23. There's going to be the excitement in chapter 24 of Jesus raising from the dead. But as of right now, in our text, the people in our text are in the in-between. No, they're in, they're in the in-between. I imagine some people are pretty frustrated. The people that actually believe that, it, that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, even though they may not have understood that Jesus, even though he's told them, they didn't understand Jesus was coming back from the dead. So in their minds, everybody just killed the Messiah and he was the greatest thing since sliced bread to them. And they're upset. And people are going around celebrating the Passover and they're like, you guys stink because it's about Jesus and you just killed him. And, 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 and they're in the in-between. And, and let me encourage you. There are, the Bible is chalked full of examples of people who could do could face adversary and difficulty and, and, and great and do great things for God, but here's what they couldn't handle. The in-between when God was quiet and did nothing. The waiting period. Let me give you some examples very quickly. Everybody know who Abraham is? Everybody heard of Abraham, maybe? Father Abraham, have any sons? Don't make I hate that song. I despise it. It's because it goes on forever. That's the problem. Anybody ever sang that song? It's like, that song could go on forever. You can start it with the right finger. <laughs> right arm. No, some of y'all know. I, I had some Sunday school teachers kept us busy for an entire Sunday school hour singing Father Abraham. I'm pretty sure because they didn't prepare the lesson. <laughs> Anyways, Father Abraham, the father of all nations, pretty, I mean, not father of all nations, but he is the father of a lot of nations, and he is our spiritual father in a lot of senses because he is the one that God made a covenant with. If you read about his life, man, he had some pretty crazy, amazing things that he did. Uh, when, whenever his, his nephew Lot was taken captive by some other kings, he rallied the troops and led a, an army to face another army, Abraham. And he was old. Like, he was like 90 old. Like making, making some of you old guys look young. You know what I mean? And he was out there fighting and he won. But you know when he, you know when he fell? You know his real difficulty? I know he had other difficulties. He fell when God came and said, Abraham, you and Sarah are going to have a child. And he laughed. And Sarah laughed because they were both old. And he said, my wife's past the years of having babies, God. She's, uh, she's 90, I'm 100. It don't happen like that no more. We ain't got it like that. And God said, no, I'm going to give her the time of her youth and y'all are going to have a good time and there's going to be a baby. And then there was the in-between. There was a promise of a child. And later down the line, we know there's a child. But then there's this in-between period. This period where God isn't talking. This period where you're waiting on a fulfillment of a promise. And in that time, Sarah goes, hey, I think God needs our help. Abraham says, yeah, you're right. She says, why don't you sleep with Hagar? <laughs> have a baby with him. Or her. And we'll, that we'll make that our baby. And that was natural. That was normal custom of the day. So don't, let's not get off track. But he didn't argue it. He didn't fight it. He's like, yeah, good idea. So they did. Out comes Ishmael. Israel today, in 2023, are facing enemies that are direct descendants of Ishmael. Today. 2023. We're talking like 5,000, uh, 4,000 years ago, a little over 4,000 years ago, and it's still a problem. Because, hang on, Abraham could go and fight and save his nephew and champion for God, but he could not handle the in-between. I got more examples, don't worry. Some of y'all are like, eh, I'm not with you yet. Well, I'll get you with me. Because I'll have fun all by myself if I have to. <laughs> How about the whole nation of Israel? Remember when Moses went up to the mount? of Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. So 40 days, God says, Moses, I want you and I want Joshua to come up here and I'm going to commune face to face with Moses. So Moses says, hey God, or guys, 
Israel, you're going to play Israel on Moses for, for the sake of the... He says, guys, God wants to talk to me. I don't know if he said it like that. I would have said it like that. I'd be like, guys, <laughs> well, you know how me and God are. <laughs> We're tight like that. So you guys hang back here, okay? Me and, me, and, me and Joshua, we're going to head up the mountain. We'll be back. Don't know when we'll be back because God's a talker. He's like my wife. He talks a lot. So I'm going to go up there. I'm going to talk to God. Y'all hang out here. And so they begin to go up this mountain. Uh, Joshua sits about halfway down or so. Moses goes up. And for 40 days, Moses is speaking face to face with God. And, he, and God, with his very finger, writes out the Ten Commandments. The nation of Israel. They have been saved from Egypt. They have crossed a a sea on dry ground. God parted the waters. These very people had stepped on dry ground walking through the middle of a sea. Moses has his time with God. He comes down the mountain. Joshua says, you hear that? What is that? Is that music? He says, you know, no, that's not music. That sounds like the noise of war. By the way, it's amazing how much music can sound like war sometimes. So they get down there. He's been gone 40 days. And here's what happened. Here's the people that had walked across on dry ground through, a, through the sea. They said, we, don't, we, we went not what happened to Moses. Basically, we don't even know what happened to him. We're not confirmed he's dead, but we don't know. It's been 40 days. Dude, it's been a month. It's been over a month. Here's what we're going to so, so Aaron, what do we do? And Aaron's like, here's what we're going to do. Everybody give me all your gold. We're going to make a gold. I, I, I'm going to make, God will make himself a, an idol for us to worship. And then they're like, cool, we're all getting naked. Read it. That's what happens. I'm not trying to be gross. That's what happens. So Moses comes down and they are, there's music and dancing and nudity and a golden calf. They're with it when, when God's walking them across the sea. And there's, there, the, the nation of Israel is with it when God's doing big things for them. But when 40 days of quiet where God's not doing anything happens, they fail. Some of y'all still ain't with me. I, I, I'm going to pull you along here. All right. Saul, very first king of Israel. Some of y'all remember Saul, maybe not. He's not the most well-known or the greatest guy in the Bible by any means. But he had a really good start. People forget that he was so godly at his start that people started to ask if he was one of the prophets. He was that godly. Go back and read. He was a good man at the start. And then he gets into a battle against the nation, uh, I think it was the, the, the Philistines, and he's panicking because uh, he's worried that he's going to lose the people and he's going to lose the battle and things are going to go bad and nobody's going to want him as king. And so he starts to panic and Samuel says, hey, be cool, be cool, be cool. I'll come out for a sacrifice. And so Saul's like, all right, cool, thanks, Samuel. By the way, Samuel at that time was the spiritual leader of the nation, and he was doing a bang-up job. Because he took them from where they were in Judges, where every man did what, that which was right in their own eyes, to a nation that was in revival. Amen. That was under Samuel. Samuel's like, be cool, be cool, calm down. I got you. I'll talk to God. We'll be fine. And so Saul's like, all right, Samuel's coming. Okay, good. When's he going to get here? When is he going to get here? Clint time. By the way, I'm watching the clock. Some of y'all are panicking. I'm all right. Sorry, sorry, watch out. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, I, I can't wait any longer. And he, hang on, listen. Without any authority to do so, without God telling him to do so, not with, because he wanted to try to, he wanted to try to force God's help in hand. He offered a sacrifice unto God, and the moment he was done, guess who strolls up? Samuel. Samuel walks up like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I got panicked. You didn't show up. It's been like 32 minutes, man." I don't know how long it was, but it wasn't that long. It's like, I, I, I freaked out. I, 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 I did it. And here's what happened. Because of that, Saul lost the chance for his family line to continue to reign in the nation of Israel. That was the start of the end for Saul. He could handle going to battle for God. He could not handle when God said, chill out and be quiet. I'm going to be quiet for five minutes. Chill. He couldn't handle the in-between. See what else I got. I brought him up earlier. Elijah. Dude, that's a preacher's favorite. Elijah on Mount Carmel's got everything I love. Got the man of God who is like bold and, and fiery and smart aleck. And then you got him going up against Baal and whipping people and killing people. And you say, you like killing people? I'm just saying I enjoy a good story. And, and it's one of those stories. So Elijah, he challenges prophets of Baal. He says, all right, let's, let's see who's real. My God or Baal? 
You, build, you 150 of you guys build an altar to Baal, I'll build an altar to God. Ladies first. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what he said, but that's how he's pictured in my mind. <laughs> Because I have an imagination when I read the Bible. Some of y'all need to get one. And so he says, ladies first. And so they start, they start cutting themselves. They start offering sacrifice and calling upon him. And he's like, Shh, I wonder if Baal's sleeping. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe you gotta, you got to call a little louder, guys. I don't think he can hear you. Maybe he went on vacation. No, these are the things he like said. I, I don't know what's going on, guys. And so he says, all right, bring me barrels of water. By the way, this is during a drought. And these didn't come from the sea because he's like, a long way from the sea. He's, so this is some faith. He's like, bring me some barrels. And he douses his offering in fire. And then, boom, flames of God. And he's like, Psh, what's up? And then he kills all of them. And it's like one of those, whoa, kind of stories. And here's what he thought. He just did something spectacular. He called fire down from heaven. If I had that, oh, man, I, I would be insufferable, y'all. <laughs> Y'all wouldn't be able to tolerate me. If I ever called fire down from heaven, y'all might as well fire me because I'm not going to stop. <laughs> so he's like, here it is. Nation of Israel is about to go into revival. Oh, yeah. All right, God, what's up? Nation doesn't go into revival. He's like, I just slew a whole lot of guys. All these wicked prophets of Baal. I just, <laughs> I just made a, sh I put on a show. First fireworks show ever, for, in fact. I'm ready for the revival. And God says, nothing. Next time you see Elijah, I'm not kidding, next time you see Elijah, he's depressed and he wants God to kill him. What? That's when I stopped liking Elijah. I'm like, dude, that is literally the start of when God says, basically, you're training your replacement. Elijah comes along, or Elisha. Elijah runs into Elisha and basically starts training his replacement from that point on. So he is able, woo, he's able to call fire down from heaven. He's able to just, I mean, he's, he is, he's being sarcastic and he's, in, it just, he's belittling these dudes and then he whips them all and he's just, yeah! And then you, you get this in between and God's not talking to him and his expectations aren't met. And the promise that, or not promise, but the, the thing he thought God was going to do doesn't happen. So then he gets over here and he's like, Psh, just kill me. These awesome men failed. Not in the face of great enemies. They failed when they had to wait on God or when their expectations of what God would do wasn't met. That's when these men failed. Sometimes the most difficult times for any follower of God is the waiting. It's the waiting. I, I, I started the message by saying that my, my first child didn't come for a while. We tried for like a year. Man, that's hard. That's tough waiting. It's hard. It's like, something wrong? Is something wrong with me? Is something wrong with her? What are we going to do? Should we check? Do we want to know? Because if it's one of us, are we going to blame each other? And I was like, Man, waiting. Waiting got me all spun out. When I, was in, when I was in New Mexico, uh, at the second church I worked, first church I work, I go to the second church that I'm working at, and that, I was at that church, and it was literally like a stepping stone, because I thought at that point we were going to plant a church, and God shut that door, and then I had no idea for months what God was doing. Now, I was serving the Lord, but I was, I was impatient and unhappy. I'm like, God, I don't want to be here in Carlsbad. I don't want to be here at Landmark. I know this is just a stepping stone. I, I really feel like you want me to pastor. Why aren't you opening the door? Waiting is hard. In fact, oftentimes there's a lot of guys that should be in ministry today. A lot of my previous friends that should be in ministry today. And you know why they're not? They're not? It's not because God did something miraculous. It's because God didn't give them the exact place they thought. Or God didn't send them to the one place they wanted to go. Or God didn't open the door right when they thought he should. And so they gave up and got a job and forgot about it. Waiting's hard. The in-between is the worst. Well, then what do we do so we don't fail or mess up in the in-between? What do we do so we don't do that? What are some steps we can take so we don't go from excitement to falling in the in-between before we ever get to the other excitement? Well, from our text, here's a few things real quick. Three things that you can do that will help you that I see right here in the text. In verse number 1 of chapter 24, it has a very special word. It says, The women showed up to the tomb early Sunday they came with spices and ointments that they prepared. Prepared. It's a special word. Now, I understand, now if you're with me, they don't, they don't even believe Jesus is coming back from the dead. 
They prepared to finish embalming him, most likely, and they prepared to anoint him the third day like the law said they should. So that was what they were preparing for. But, but let me encourage you, even though they weren't preparing to do what was right, they were preparing to do what they believed was right. What they should have been doing is like sitting by his tomb being like, he'll be here early Sunday morning, he'll be here. That's where they should But the, Remember, these are the ladies that at least prepared and did something. Where's all the disciples? So, they, they prepared. One thing we can do while we're waiting on God is prepare. Let me give some examples. Some of y'all, that's, that's vague. Prepare for what? Some of y'all are giving me that look. And so I'll help. Maybe you've been praying for a prodigal child. Maybe one of your children, they've gone astray. They don't, you know, you raised them right in church. And now you're like, God, look at what they're doing in their life. And so, you're praying for them. But you're in that in-between where you've been praying for them. But... They certainly walked into the church doors. You know what I mean? They're not here. They're not there. You're just here where it stinks. And you're just panicked and stressed. Like, what are they doing? Well, let me encourage you to prepare. So prepare how? Well, the, prop of the, the dad of the prodigal child, man, he had a fatted calf prepared and ready to go. He had ring and shoes and robes. And, and he was ready to welcome him back. And let me encourage you, maybe you prepare that way. Uh, how about you make sure you're at church for the Sunday they walk in? Wouldn't that be discouraging to them when they're like, you know what? My mom has been begging, my dad's been begging me to come back to church, and they walk into church on a Sunday morning, and they're like, and I don't know them, and I'm like, hey, how are you doing? Welcome to Peaky Baptist Church. And they're like, is so-and-so and so-and-so here? And I'm like, oh, you know what? Not today. I don't know where they are. But yeah, you, yeah, they're here. They're members, whatever. And they're like, well, that's my dad. That's my mom. I'm like, ooh, awkward. <laughs> how about this? Prepare financially. You know, oftentimes when a kid's been in the prodigal, or being the prodigal and he's out in the far country, oftentimes he's gonna, he might need a little financial help to come back. Say, oh, I don't have any extra money. I know, I'm just saying prepare. Maybe set aside a little fund that if they decide to come back, you can financially help them get on their feet so they can serve the Lord. Maybe you've got to prepare some room in your house for that kid so that when they come back, they have somewhere to go and they, that you can help them. Prepare. Perhaps you've been praying for your spouse. And maybe it's to get saved. Maybe it's to start being faithful to church or coming to church or whatever it is. And you're praying for your spouse and you're like, Lord, soften their heart. Lord, help them. Lord, be with them. Whatever it is. And, you're, and you, you've prayed and so you, you're in the in-between and nothing's happening. You're like, God, well, prepare. Well, prepare how? Uh, for one, let, let me say this. Uh, wives, if it's your husband and you, maybe you've been praying for God, get, make him the spiritual leader of our home and maybe he starts coming to church and praise the Lord for that. By the way, I'll use the same illustration. You ought to be, it'd be bad if the morning he decides, you know what, I'm going to go to church with her. Or she says, you know what, I'm going to go to church with him. She, and they walk in, they say, let's go to church. You're like, I wasn't planning on going today. And you're like lounging around and like drinking coffee and watching the news and you're like, I wasn't going to go today. And then they're like, let's go. And you're like, cut off guard. So don't do that. That'd be shame. But, but, Perhaps if it's your husband, ladies, maybe when he does start trying to be a spiritual leader, you don't shoot him down, you try to encourage it. You prepare to follow the lead. No, I know it's easy because you're like, no, I'm the spiritual one. Like, I've been, to, I've been faithful to church. I've, I know the Bible. And they're, they're like a new Christian or they're, they're, they're young in the Lord. Or they, they don't really even know. Well, it's it, prepare. Prepare. Be ready for that time when it comes. Perhaps you've been praying and asking God to reveal like a new ministry. Talking to our church members, maybe you say, God, give me something else I can do in the church. Give me somewhere else I can serve. Give me something else I can do. Uh, why don't you start like gaining skills for whatever it may be? If you think one day, maybe just one day, God may make you a Sunday school teacher, why don't you start preparing material? Gathering things together. Next thing we see in our text, we've got to hurry here. These ladies were sacrificial. You say, I don't see that in the text. Well, in Mark's account of this, in, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four books are all written about Jesus, and so they give us different pictures. In Mark's account of this very section, it says not only did they prepare the spice, but they went and bought the ointment and spices. They had to buy it with, with like money. Now, if they were Baptists, they'd have just stole it, but that's a different story. No, I'm just, just I'm kidding. I'm a Baptist. Anyways, they, they bought them. You know why? They bought those things because they love Jesus. And, and, and I've said this before, but I'm a firm believer in it. Love will cost you something. I got three, about to be four kids. If you've seen my wife, she is great with child. Pray for her. Pray for me she don't kill me before this baby gets here. I love all of my children. But because I love them, they cost me. They're expensive. Like, 
Your parents say that? Like, my parents say kids are expensive before you had them. They're like, oh, kids are expensive. I'm like, it's diapers, it's clothes. What do you mean? No, they're expensive. Like, where do these, where do these come from? And they're, I'm like, I'm dreading teenage years. I'm like, they got to have something to drive? They ain't driving my stuff. So, so I guess they're going to ride a Huffy. <laughs> and it's just, it's constant expenses. But you know what? No, I love them. My kids want to play soccer? Go play soccer. The cost, by the way, soccer hasn't just cost me money. It cost me time because I always have to coach. And that's a commitment. And I love my wife. Man, I love my wife. All my heart. She second greatest thing to ever happen to me next to salvation. And so there's not much she asked for that I won't come hell or high water. I'll, I'll make it happen. If I got to give up, if I got to sell something, if I got to go donate plasma, I'll make it happen. So you donate plasma? I said, if I got to, shh. I said, I love her. Because <laughs> love costs you. These ladies love Jesus so much, they said, we will take it upon ourselves to purchase whatever it takes to do right by him. Now, we can make it about money, but let me just be general with it. If you don't want to mess up in that in-between, in that waiting period, when the promise hasn't come, if you don't want to mess up in that time frame, then let me encourage you, Keep sacrificing. I have been. The more you invest, the more you sacrifice, the better off you're going to be. The better off you're going to be. Well, pastor, I've been giving to the church and I've been giving to missions for X amount and money's still tight. Well, let me, let me, let me warn you. The, the, the preachers that preach the prosperity gospel, those, that's all lies. God never said, you give me 10%, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it come tenfold. God said, I'll open you up the windows of heaven and bless you. His blessings happen without it being money. It's not always money. Sometimes the blessing is just health. That's right. You can work. You can move around. You can get a second job. You can do something. Sometimes those blessings are, are gifts you don't expect. Sometimes, some of y'all know the story of my truck. That, that truck literally cost me not even a dollar. Tax, title, license, it cost me absolutely zero. It's a 2015 three-quarter ton Silverado. How do you do that? My God. My God. Because God's blessings don't always come the way you want. Well, I just, I've, been, I've been waiting for those blessings. Keep sacrificing. Prepare. Wait. God will open up the heavens and bless you. One more thing. We've got to hurry. Gosh, why are you all slowing me down, guys? Jeez. These ladies were obedient. <laughs> obedient. How? Well, like I said, it was the law required that you had to come anoint the body three days later. And so, uh, keep in mind, they had a Sabbath day where they couldn't buy or prepare anything because that would have been considered work and you couldn't do that on Thursday. They had a Sabbath day of Saturday, couldn't buy or sell anything. And it's Saturday, Saturday is the Sabbath day. And they got there early on Sunday. So they had one day that they could do something and they did it. They got it done. And they showed up Sunday morning, obedient, ready to do what they believed was right, what the law required. If you're in that in-between time and you're praying for that spouse, you're praying for those kids, you're praying for that ministry opportunity, you're praying for things to get better, you're praying for church growth, you're praying for this, you're praying for that, you're praying for your neighbors, you're praying for your friends, you're, 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 you're here in the waiting period, you've made the prayer, the, it hasn't happened, you're right here, let me encourage you, just keep being obedient. Just keep being obedient. Because why would God answer your prayers when you go off and start being disobedient anyway? In that 85 hours, they did their best to be obedient, even though they didn't understand. So let's wrap this up really quick. Here we go. Pastor, I've, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed. And I, I still don't have what I asked for. God hasn't answered my prayers. What do I do? Prepare, sacrifice, be obedient. No, no you don't understand. It's been years. No, I know. I do understand. Prepare, sacrifice, be obedient. And in God's time and in God's way, He'll work it out. Just don't give up in the in-between. Oh, I've, well, I've witnessed to this person for years now and nothing is happening. What am I supposed to do? Prepare, sacrifice, obey. Here's an example. You say to somebody, hey, come to church with me and, and then we'll have you over after. After church. Then you should plan every Sunday to have somebody over. Prepare that way. We keep desserts in the freezer, you know, like Edward's pies or little cakes that you can freeze. We keep those in the freezer like for, at all times, just in case. We're prepared. 
It's going to cost us. We're going to sacrifice our afternoon if it happens. We're going to be obedient in those time frames because we don't want to give up in the in-between. I hate the in-between. I hate it. When these ladies laid eyes on Jesus, here's my final promise and encouragement. When these ladies laid eyes on Jesus, when they got to this point where Jesus rose from the dead and they witnessed him and they saw him, do you think they thought about the in-between anymore? I'm betting all that washed right over them. You see, uh, every time I've held any one of my children, they're in the hospital just the first time I held them. You know what I didn't think about? The miserable time in between where my wife's making me do projects and she's pulling everything out of closets and she's kind of hard to deal with sometimes and she's wanting random things and, and being difficult because she's pregnant. I forget about all that the moment that happens. When I do get in shape, now I'll tell you about it if I ever get there. <laughs> Driving away with the minivan that day, you know what I forgot about? All the misery of that day. Now, it continued on to tell you the rest of the story. We got home, and my son, who was the youngest at that time, he drank milk at night still before bed. And he's drinking milk. He walks into our bedroom and goes, huh, all over our carpet. I'm like, no more milk for you. But I forgot all about the misery of sitting there doing the paperwork because now we had the vehicle. Waiting on God is miserable sometimes, but waiting for that prayer, that blessing, that prodigal, that family member, waiting on those things, when the wait is over, you'll forget all the miserable parts of it. You'll forget all the bad and all the negative. From Thursday to Sunday was miserable, but they forgot all about it Sunday morning when he walked out of that, well, actually, they didn't see him walk out of the tomb, when he was standing outside of that tomb and they didn't even realize it was him. So let me encourage you this this morning, I was about to say this evening. It's been that long preaching, I know. Some of you are saying, I know. <laughs> Don't give up on the in-between. You've prayed. Maybe God's promised. But you're here and nothing has happened. You're waiting on that job. You're waiting on that kid. You're waiting on that, that growth. You're waiting on that health. You're waiting on whatever it is. Don't give up here. Because it'll be real special there. Now, real quick. I thought it was done. I know, one thing. One thing you don't have to wait for is trusting Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. That's something that you could have today. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the Bible teaches, this isn't just what I say, this is what the Bible teaches. This is in the Baptist way, this is in Stephen Jones' way. The Bible teaches that we're all sinners and that we can't work our way to heaven and that we have to, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have to ask Him to save us and then He saves us and that's how we get to heaven when we die. That's how we're born again believers. And I would love to show you from the Bible how, how to do that. We're about to have an invitation and anybody who wants to talk to somebody about getting saved, trusting Jesus Christ their personal Savior, we'd love to do that with you today. We won't embarrass you. We don't force anybody to make any decisions. We'll get you sat down with somebody you're comfortable with. You can bring whoever you want with you. We'll take you to one of these offices. We'll sit you down. We'll show you what the Bible says. We won't force you to do anything. We'll show you what it says and let you make a decision for Christ. The wait will be worth it. The wait will be worth it. Just prepare, sacrifice, and obey. Let's pray. Heads back.